Hey everybody and welcome back to H Invests. Today we're going to be talking about Borg Warner, a high quality company with significant electric vehicle exposure that may be undervalued. I'm going to make this presentation a little bit more concise than my previous presentation so please let me know your thoughts on that. If you enjoy this content I would appreciate a like, it's really helping the channel to grow. Uh, please comment with any thoughts, any questions you may have, we can get a discussion going and uh, subscribe if you enjoy my content and you'd like to see more in the future. Okay, so let's get into it. So who are Borg Warner? As I mentioned, they have EV exposure. They're in the automotive and parts industry. Their market cap is around 11 billion. Uh, so they're a tier one uh, global auto parts supplier with significant exposure to the electric vehicle market. The key points of the thesis is the diversified exposure on EV, the strong financials, and also the shares are trading at a discount to their fair value. Okay, so I mentioned tier one a minute ago. What exactly does this mean? So the way things work in automotives is there are kind of three tiers of uh, supplies to the car market. You've got tier one and they basically help uh, automotive companies with the major things, the specialized engineering parts, you know, the engines, the drivetrains, the chassis, anything that's core and highly technical and very much helps the, the car to run, that will come under tier one. Tier two, still a little bit specialized, but not so much. In tier two, you've got things like car window motors, you know, door handle uh, mechanisms, stuff like that, stuff that's not quite as specialized as tier one. And then tier three is very basic, you know, think of the raw commodities, stuff that's not specialized. Uh, the examples I've got here are glass for the windows, interior materials, that might be the leather for the seats, etc etc and I mentioned that Borg Warner was tier one okay so why is this significant um, these are the kind of products they make first so you can see some very technical uh, car parts here for their electric they've got an electric drive motor uh, a combustion AWD transfer case it's all very technical stuff that they make now why is this important to the investment thesis effectively being tier one um, gives Borg Warner an economic moat. How does it give Borg Warner an economic moat, you ask? It's effectively through switching costs, right? So you imagine you're making all of these complex products to these very well established car companies, right? They are not going to switch supplier at a moment's notice. They're going to go back to Borg Warner. Borg Warner knows what they, uh, what they want. They've worked, have a deep relationship. They understand the kind of things that these car companies are after. It's not a particularly easy thing to do to change supply of engines when you have somebody like Borg Warner who already knows you well and they know what your specifications are, they can tweak those specifications for, for later models, etc. etc. You know, VW Ford and Hyundai, they make up about a third of Borg Warner's revenue. So that's their moat around switching costs. They also have another moat around scale advantage. So in the bottom left, you can actually see which companies Borg Warner work with and over what geographies. This is incredibly diverse across companies and geographies, right? And this is great because you can get exposure to the EV market with VW, with Ford, with Hyundai, with everyone, as opposed to just investing in one electric car company that's kind of an all or nothing. It might be very overvalued, but have an amazing idea. Borg Warner gives you uh, exposure to it across the whole uh, sector. So that's its geography. Going back to the economic moat, this geography gives Borg Warner a scale advantage, and let me explain why. So, many countries have laws that require the car components are sourced in the same country, but Borg Warner is a very large um, car supplier that they have physical presence in 18 different countries, and this makes the law incredibly easy for them to satisfy this condition relative to smaller firms. If it was a small firm and it only had like a factory in three different countries, it'd be very difficult for them to sell globally. But Borg Warner can do that and it can sell to all of these amazing car brands all over the world because of its level of physical presence. It also means that because the um, parts are produced very uh, in a very similar location to where they're sold, there's not particularly big transportation costs, which also helps give it an economic moat under scale advantage. Okay, so investing in the future, Borg Warner are trying to put as much as they can into the electric parts size of their business. And you can just see the potential here uh, for electric cars over the next five years. They have an amazing pipeline that they've been developed 
and they're very much focused on innovation. Obviously this goes hand in hand with the macro. Electric vehicles, they really are the future and uh, governments are all around the world are realizing this in the UK where I'm from. Uh, Boris Johnson said a few months ago that he wanted to ban the sale of new petrol and diesel cars by 2030, which is absolutely crazy. Like Biden, uh, you know, replacing government fleet with electric vehicles, the EU, Japan. These are just some examples I picked out. The transformation to electric vehicles all over the world is completely and utterly unprecedented. And all of these companies that I mentioned in the previous slide, like VW, like Ford, they want to get on this trend. And what are they gonna do? They're gonna go straight to Borg Warner and they're gonna say, can you help me develop a, a tier one engine uh, for our new brand of electric car in the future? Okay, so there's also acquisitions that Borg Warner have done that they're now integrating into their business model to help them transform to the electric vehicle market. So you have Delphi, so they've really helped with uh, Borg Warner's integrated drive module. And then also Akasol, which basically they're one of the world's leading supplier of the batteries in the electric vehicle market. Borg Warner bought them recently and are currently integrating them into their business. So in the most recent earnings call, which was just a couple of weeks ago, uh, Borg Warner announced that 45% of their backlog is now in electric vehicles. So they are significantly uh, deepening their business in the area of electric vehicles. Okay, so this all sounds amazing, but what are some risks to consider? So, uh, first things first, COVID-19, <laughs> everyone probably knew I thought I'd mention it, um, is slowing down production and orders, or at least it was quite a lot in kind of Q1, Q2 of 2020. This has got a lot better as businesses have learned to live with the pandemic, but we saw a slight drop in turnover uh, from Borg Warner in 2020. However, the analysts see this as a real temporary uh, headwind and we see turnover going back up uh, incredibly over the next three years as part of their forecasts. But yes, they are in a, we are in a cyclical industry uh, and COVID has disrupted a little bit of Borg Warner's work. Uh, so to give you an idea, their beta is 1.23 over a 10 year period. So they are more volatile than the market over time. Another thing to consider is high operational leverage. So this works in both ways, right? Like if companies like Borg Warner who have high levels of fixed costs, research and development, labor, etc., etc., um, if they do very, very well and those costs are fixed, then they can expand their profit margins very, very quickly. But if their turnover goes down, and they saw these fixed costs to cover, uh, it can often lead the business into a pretty sticky situation. So that's something to bear in mind as well. We'll take a look at the financials in a minute. I don't think it's affecting Borg Warner's business model much at all, uh, but it is worth to bear in mind a high proportion of their costs are fixed. This is the other thing is that obviously everybody wants to get into electric vehicles right now and Borg Warner are having to uh, innovate in order to stay ahead. So the high research and development spending, it can hurt margins, particularly at the moment when a lot of acquisitions are being made and Borg Warner are now taking the time to increase their research and development expenses so that pays off in the long term. And finally, fluctuations in commodity prices. Obviously, the prices of commodities can be very volatile. Aluminium has gone up recently, and I'm sure a lot of Borg Warner's products are made out of aluminium, um, but Borg Warner do do their best to hedge against rising commodity prices. Okay, so let's take a look at some of their financials now. So firstly, starting with the balance sheet, I thought it'd be better to do it like this than kind of break it all down line by line. But just some key metrics, price to uh, net asset value, only about 1.7, which I thought was very low for this company. And quick ratio above one, Borg Warner's balance sheet is healthy. Um, then you've got their interest cover. Their interest cover on their debt has always been superb. They've always been very good at managing that. And then their debt to free cash flow five. So they can pay off all of their debt in five years, which is perfect. As you can see, the total borrowing has gone up here, which I have highlighted, but a lot of this money has been used for acquisitions, which I think will pay off. And as you can see, even when you have this increase in total borrowing, the actual health of the balance sheet indicated by these four metrics is actually looking very good and very sustainable. Okay, so next we come to the income statement. So as I said, we had a little bit of a flat turnover, but analysts are forecasting this to go up again as Borg Warner's acquisitions pay off and as COVID and the temporary headwinds from that start to die down. Uh, this exactly the same thing happened with operating profit um, and the EBIT margin, as we said, 
that we're seeing a lower EBIT margin because of the extra research and development that Borg Warner are investing in now to get their electric vehicle acquisitions to the best place that they can be. And then with regards to valuation, so we've got an EV, EV to EBITDA of about nine here, which I think is absolutely crazy. Like given the amount of exposure that Borg Warner has to electric vehicles at the moment, and given how we're seeing so many companies in that sector completely and utterly overpriced, this is a very, very good opportunity to, to come in at a cheap price. And then the cash flow statement. So again, we have a price to free cash flow of 13.3, which I think is a very generous uh, valuation and is actually a lot cheaper uh, than what it used to be. So operating cash flow has actually gone up. Um, that's because Borg Warner, they always see a lot of people that are kind of due to pay them, um, who paid them for 2020. So that's gone up. Free cash flow, again, very, very sustainable, very, very much growing. Uh, and you can see um, a really positive trajectory uh, forecasted by the analysts. CapEx are operating cash flow. I was pretty surprised with how low this was for such a capital intensive company, but we're looking around, you know, around 35 to, to 45%. Uh, and it looks pretty stable and pretty sustainable for Borg Warner. So nothing really to comment on there. And now let's take a look at the valuation. So I mentioned at the start that this company was undervalued. Uh, here is my DCF valuation, which is just it's just amazing, like 62% upside um, with the shares being valued at $72.60. And this is just using the average uh, analyst's cash flow forecasts over the next three years. That's all we're doing, just using their forecasts over the next three years. We're not going any further, uh, but discount rate is 10.4%, which I think is, you know, is a very fair discount rate. Uh, with the, the beta has been pulling that up a bit because obviously the beta is above one But even with that kind of discount rate for this to be undervalued by this much I think gives us a really really good margin of safety Again, if we look at this on a price to earnings basis uh, With the earnings per share forecast we get the average earnings per share forecast uh, We take a standardized price to earnings ratio from the last five years uh, which comes out at about 15 uh, again, I think that's pretty generous for somebody who's got so much EV exposure, a price to earnings ratio of 15. So then we use that price to earnings ratio of 15, we discount the uh, earnings per share, and then we multiply the discounted earnings per share by the price to earnings. And um, yeah, you get the evaluations over time, but the four year one for 2024 gives us a valuation of $67.23. So again, it's undervalued by 50% according to that model. Uh, and Morningstar, they got quite a similar metric for this one. They think these shares are worth about $66. So that was basically everything I had to say on Borg Warner. Quality uh, electric car company. I think this gives you some great exposure and I love what they're doing with their growth and with their acquisitions at the moment. Uh, keep in mind for those cyclical headwinds and that high operational gearing uh, that Borg Warner are gonna face. But if you want a quality company, uh, with decent exposure and diversified exposure across the electrical vehicle market with companies like Ford and VW uh, in long-term contracts with this company that's cheap and trading at massive discounts to intrinsic value both on a DCF uh, and a price to earnings basis then I'd highly consider Borg Warner. I really hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, please let me know your thoughts and until next time, happy investing.